Welcome to Let's Rewatch It Again. I'm Jordan, and listen, Scrooge, if men were measured by kindness, you'd be no bigger than a speck of dust. That quote might be a little misleading because there are so many adaptations of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. Today, we are re-watching Mickey's Christmas Carol from 1983, the first adaptation Disney produced. The second was the infamous Muppet Christmas Carol, another favorite of mine. This was also the first adaptation of the Christmas Carol to feature animals as the characters rather than humans. Alan Young voiced Ebenezer Scrooge and continued his role as Scrooge McDuck for the DuckTales. So if his voice sounds familiar, it should. This is the last film for Clarence Nash to provide the voice of Donald Duck and the first time for Wayne Alwine to provide the voice for Mickey Mouse. Hal Smith is the voice of Jacob Marley's ghost, Goofy, and Patricia Perez is the voice of Isabel, also known as Daisy Duck. The two of them would later star in The New Adventures of Winnie the Pooh from 1988 as the voices of Owl and Kanga. Minnie Mouse plays Mrs. Cratchit. Though she doesn't have a single line, Russi Taylor did record dialogue, though it was never used in the finished film. Pluto is the only member of the Disney Sensational Six who is not in this movie. Sensational Six is the name given to the collective group of Mickey, Minnie, Donald, Goofy, Daisy, and Pluto, if you didn't know. This is also the last film to include long opening credits with only the end instead of no end credits. I remember fast forwarding the opening credits. I remember fast forwarding all the way through these opening credits on my VHS as a child. They are so long. At least they felt really long. Today I realize they are only two minutes. Speaking of opening credits, let's hit play. And in my 90s style, I am going to breeze right through these credits and go right to our opening scene looking over a beautiful snow-covered London town. This adaptation is so similar to the Muppets. You're going to see a lot of faces and cartoon characters that you've seen in other Disney Mickey Mouse films, but instead of seeing them in their normal roles, they're just playing background cast of the London town. Ebenezer is walking through town and one of the poor people asks him for a penny and he says, bah, because of course he does. <laughs> he goes up to his place of work, the counting house, as it says on the building, and he taps the hanging sign because it's covered in snow. It says Scrooge and Marley below it, and Marley is just simply crossed out. And he says, ah, Jacob Marley. Sorry, I am i won't do the, the accent the entire time. <laughs> um, he says that Jacob Marley was a good one because he he robbed from the poor and then of course left just enough money in the will for Scrooge to pay for his tombstone and then Scrooge was even cheaper than that and buried him at sea so that's disrespectful but we're just gonna keep going we go into the counting house and Mickey Mouse is playing our Bob Cratchit who is just oh my gosh I am obsessed with Bob Cratchit because of Mickey Mouse like I absolutely adore the way he plays this role I really adore the way that Kermit plays it in Muppets Christmas Carol as well. But seriously, the role of Bob Cratchit is just so underrated, in my opinion. We focus a lot on Scrooge, Tiny Tim, the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future. But Bob Cratchit, to me, feels like the star of the show. Now, this film is in classic 2D animation, which means that the backgrounds are painted rather than drawn. And everything is hand drawn in this film. Everything. I truly, truly miss 2D animation. It's one of my favorite things in the entire world. And I dearly, dearly wish that there was a way we could return to it and just forget these stinking computers or just find a way to mesh them together. I don't know. But I truly miss 2D animation. And this film is so incredibly beautiful. Even as the characters move around, everything in the background feels real, but in a very cartoon way. Nothing feels silly or goofy. Well, okay, goofy in this film is obviously very goofy. But everything in the background is just so perfectly executed by hand. I mean, I just, I can't. I wish, I wish. Scrooge finds Mickey trying to put a single 
coal into the furnace just to thaw out the ink, which is also covered in snow. And Scrooge is like, absolutely not, tosses it away and says he needs to get back to work. And Mickey has the cutest little step stool of books to climb up onto his chair that is very tall for him. And then he does the unthinkable and asks Scrooge for half a day off for Christmas. And Scrooge is like, are you kidding me right now? Obviously not. And Scrooge is super grumpy about it, but he's like, well, I guess, whatever. As if like, well, I didn't let you light the furnace, so I guess I'll let you have Christmas. Then he drops the awful other shoe and says he's going to dock him half a day's pay. So he's not really getting half day off. He's just leaving halfway through the day and not getting paid for it. Or coming in halfway through the day and still working? Like, what really needs to happen tomorrow? That is my question. But Bob Cratchit is so grateful. And he's like, really? And then we reveal that Scrooge pays Bob Cratchit two shillings and a half a day because three years ago he got a raise of half a shilling. And then Bob Cratchit says, well, yeah, I started your laundry. That was the raise. He just gave him another responsibility that definitely was not in that job description. He tosses the laundry bag at Bob Cratchit. And I just, I love it when a cartoon character gets their mouth like covered by something and then you hear it all muffled like, I mean, literally, I have been watching this movie probably my entire life. Everything about it is such a vibe. The, the little stacks of gold coins, the little brown bags that Scrooge carries around that are also full of coins, the sound of the coins clinking together inside the little fabric bags. Oh, it's everything. I also love the idea that behind his desk, Scrooge has a giant wall safe with a massive padlock. And then beside it is a huge ring of keys. I don't know what all these keys are for. All I can assume is that one of them goes to the safe and the other three are just to trick you. I'm not sure. But I absolutely love the idea that he is so rich that he needs a safe in his office to keep all of his giant gold coins. I mean, oh my goodness. The, creating this character and then taking off with it for DuckTales was genius. Then Scrooge begins counting his collections from McDuff and adds that he had 80% interest. Oh my God. Who in their right mind is doing business with Scrooge? I can only come to the conclusion that he's the only man in town to work with because how is he doing this? And then he cuddles all of the money bags together and bounces his little duck booty in the air and his tiny little duck tail just like waggles back and forth. I can't, I can't. <laughs> So unbelievably cute. And then we get a beautiful tiny shot of the bell above the door ringing and Scrooge's nephew, played by Donald Duck, enters the scene holding a wreath with a red bow. Bob Cratchit is over the moon excited to see Fred, the nephew, come through the door because I'm sure they don't get many visitors. And Scrooge is nonplussed that someone is interrupting his day of business. And he's so annoyed because he's like, there's nothing merry about Christmas. It's just another work day. And then he says any jackanapes who think anything else should be boiled in their own pudding. What is a jackanape? I am only seeing that because of the subtitles that I now use in my daily life. And I have always wondered what that word is. And it's not until now that I had the ability to have subtitles because I'm watching it on Disney+. Plus. But jackanapes? What? He's so upset. Bob Cratchit says that Christmas is a time of giving, a time to be with one's family. And Scrooge just says, bah humbug at that. Donald is saying, well, I say Merry Christmas and puts the wreath over his head. And Bob Cratchit begins to clap to agree with him. And Scrooge is like, seriously, you want to keep your job? Then Fred reveals that he's inviting Scrooge to Christmas dinner and came to give him a wreath. Scrooge gets excited and asks him about what he's having, plum pudding with lemon sauce. And that sounds fantastic. Candied fruit, sugar spiced cakes. And Fred is like, so you'll come? And he's like, are you daft, man? You know I can't eat that stuff. Why? Ooh, th this is intriguing. Does Scrooge have diabetes? Because he mentioned mostly sweets. So I'm wondering if he is just like super insulted or if be he is so rich, he won't spend his money. So he won't even spend money on things that other people are just wishing they could spend money on. We get a quick look at Bob Cratchit again as Scrooge kicks Fred out the door and we see a sign on the wall that says time is money. Genius. Such little tricks in the background to just really hit home that Scrooge is all about money, all about it. 
Not a single thing is wasted. Opposite of spared no expense, like in Jurassic Park. Scrooge puts the wreath completely over Fred's body, <laughs> strangling him in it, and kicks him out the door violently. Fred comes back and says, Merry Christmas, and hangs the wreath on the doorknob before slamming the door shut behind him. Bob Cratchit says, Ah, oh, that Fred, so full of kindness. And Scrooge says, I, he was always a little peculiar. I don't know if my accent is that good. We're just going to leave it there. Like I said, I've seen this movie a ridiculous amount of times. I can probably speak the words with the characters, but also I am of Irish descent, so it's close to Scottish, which is the accent that Scrooge McDuck and Alan Young both have. Just saying. The door opens again and we have two characters enter the room and it, oh goodness, they look like gentlemen. So Scrooge is excited because he's like, yeah, I'm going to steal from these guys. But they are solicitors trying to help the destitute, collecting for the poor. And Scrooge is like, oh, really? And then he says, you realize if you give money to the poor, they won't be poor anymore. Well, yeah. And then you won't have to raise money for them. So I, so I suppose if you don't have to raise money for them anymore you'll be out of a job. Please, gentlemen, don't ask me to put you out of a job. Not on Christmas Eve. And he looks so upset and the men are like, wait, what? And he's like pushing them out the door as he's saying all this. He throws the wreath at them and slams the door and the wreath hangs on the smaller man's nose and twirls back and forth. Oh my God, such a vibe. And I love that we're seeing this manipulation on Scrooge's behalf because we're seeing how he's probably just bamboozled so much money out of so many other gentlemen who are so much kinder than himself that they really, you wouldn't expect someone to be quite this villainous in real life. And so you're like, oh, well, he probably didn't mean that. No, he had best intentions. And then shoo, there goes your pocket. Then Scrooge tells Bob Cratchit that he's worked all his life for money. And then people just want you to give it away. We fade to watching Bob Cratchit trying to warm his hands by the lamplight. Can't even imagine how cold it is. We see the snow piling up against the windows and then the clock chimes and it's time to go home. The sound of the book shutting as Bob Cratchit snaps it shut is, oh, I love that sound. I love the sound of a book closing like that. Scrooge claims that the clock is two minutes fast and Bob Cratchit immediately begins working again. And Scrooge says, well, never mind two minutes. You may go now. And Bob Cratchit is like, oh, thank you, sir. And <laughs> Scrooge says, never mind the mushy stuff. Go and have your day off and be back here earlier the next day. Chipper Bob Cratchit is like, oh, of course I will, sir. And a bah humbug to... I mean, a Merry Christmas to you, sir. <laughs> I love it because he hears Scrooge say bah humbug all the live long day. I'm sure that does start to just stick into your brain. The day becomes even later and Scrooge does not leave his place of work until nine o'clock at night. Man, that's late. I mean, he must be hungry, right? I, but you know, if you are saving, 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 maybe you don't even spend money on food because it's just too extravagant. Just gotta save that money for... What? I'm not sure. Watch it pile up. He walks through the town that is cold and dark because everyone is in their homes having Christmas dinner. And he walks up to his green front door, which I love that it's green, green like money. This door knocker morphs into Goofy's face and says, Scrooge. But can I just say, this scared me so bad. Is a little taut. Oh my God. But at the same time, it's comforting because it's goofy. But you're like, why is he talking like that? Why are his eyes all weird and heavy? Like, what, what is going on? And Scrooge recognizes that it's Jacob Marley's voice. And he's like, it can't be. And he looks at the face and tries to, like, pinch the nose. And Goofy goes, oh. And then Scrooge runs inside and slams the door. And it's completely dark because, of course, he's not going to light any lamps that would spend money. And so he walks up the stairs and we see his shadow against the wall. And then Jacob Marley's shadow, with chains hanging down, follows him up the stairs. Scrooge turns around and there's a little swirl as the shadow disappears and then keeps following him. Scrooge pokes at the shadow with his cane and it sh again. And then he's creeping up the stairs. The shadow is creeping up the stairs and even like does the little thing where it takes off his top hat. <laughs> And then Scrooge reaches behind him with the king and pokes at Goofy's belly and the and Goofy giggles at it. Oh my God. And then Scrooge runs up the stairs, slams the door to what I think is his bedroom and activates five different locks. 
the deadbolt, another deadbolt, the actual doorknob with the key, one closer to the floor, and then a foot lock that he uses with his duck foot. And oh my gosh, that lives in my head rent free. And now he is very, very frazzled because someone is knocking at the door and it's Jacob Marley's voice howling, Ebenezer Scrooge. And Ebenezer's like, go away. And then slowly, Jacob Marley fades into the room as a teal ghost and then trips over Ebenezer's cane and slams into the back of his giant burgundy wingback chair and rattles the entire room. <laughs> Scrooge is trembling as the teal ghost pops up next to him. <laughs> and he's like, don't you recognize me? I was your partner, Jacob Marley. And what's interesting is Scrooge lights a candle to see the ghost. As Jacob Marley moves, the sound of the chains sounds suspiciously like the clinking of gold coins. That is not something I was able to put together as a child, but as I grew older and watched it at least every Christmas, I began to notice little things like that, that the sound effects they use are so close together. Is the money chaining you up? Jacob Marley gets angry with Scrooge and says, I robbed the widows and swindled the poor, remember? And then Scrooge says, yes, all in the same day, you had class. And then Jacob's like, yeah, I did. Wait a minute. No, I didn't. <laughs> I was wrong. And I, as punishment, I'm forced to carry these heavy chains through eternity. And he throws the chains around Ebenezer. And we get a cute little moment as Goofy says, even longer, probably. And then he says, he's doomed. And the same thing will happen to you. And he's wrapping the chains more and more around Scrooge as it gets closer. And Scrooge is trying to untangle himself. And he's like, no, help me. I don't want this to happen. Marley reveals that three spirits will visit him that night. Listen to them. Do what they say or your chains will be heavier than mine. And then he says, farewell. And he starts to back away. And we see him almost step on the cane again. And he kind of like giggles scoops up his chains with the little treasure boxes and then says farewell and slowly fades through the door <laughs> it's making me cold just watching it I can't. but i like that even though this is a little bit on the spookier side we still have the giggle of goofy and a little bit of playfulness so that like Yes, a small child can watch this movie and not be traumatized. I actually think it's a really good movie to introduce your child to The Christmas Carol without it being too terrifying. Because I actually think that The Muppets Christmas Carol is a lot scarier. Then we hear Marley fall all the way down the stairs and it shakes the entire room, which is such an excellent way to comically end the scene because now poor Scrooge is terrified and he's shining his single candle around the room into his empty cold fireplace underneath the bed where the light illuminates everything it touches oh it's so good and then he blows out the candle and shuts the curtains around his bed and instantly begins snoring but the curtains pull in and out with his snores because of course they do and the first ghost is the Christmas pass, and it's Gemini Cricket. Are you kidding me? This is excellent. He hops up onto the nightstand, onto the little candle, hand, onto the handle of our candlestick, and clinks the little bell of his alarm clock with his little umbrella. It's brilliant. When Scrooge opens his eyes and peeks through the curtain, Jiminy opens his coat to reveal a gold badge that says Ghost of Christmas Past. And Scrooge is like, oh, I thought you'd be taller. The ghost is, of course, very insulted. Excuse you. And that is where we get our opening quote of, listen, Scrooge, if men were measured by kindness, you'd be no bigger than a speck of dust. Then Scrooge rolls over with a yawn and says that kindness is of little use in this world. Whoa, whoa. I can't imagine coming to the point in your life where you believe that kindness is completely useless. I, wow. And it also makes me wonder, like, who hurt you, Scrooge? Like, it is such a powerful statement and so heartbreaking all at the same time. We need a villain origin story, which is great because, which is good because we're about to go into the past with Jiminy as our guide. Thank goodness. Jiminy hops over to the window, opens it, and the wind and snow start to blow in. And he's like, we got to go out there. 